off the back of my last uh, few videos over the last month or so, um, I think there was a comment made uh, multiple times where it's like, yeah, you could go through life doing uh, everything, like doing nothing wrong. But like, can you like, if, like you said, even if this guy, he gets married, he looks happy, say it doesn't work out in five or 10 years, A, will he personally regret it? Will exactly, you know, like it doesn't matter if everyone says, oh, objectively, that is a loss. Uh, that's completely terrible. Uh, you know, basically it's black and white. But the nuance is, is he grateful for the time he had with her? Yeah, the last year or so might have uh, been shitty or something might have happened uh, that turned uh, the, the marriage around and and everything changed. You know, it's not necessarily that she was a villain and you were a saint, but um, there are nuances. But everyone likes to paint the picture that, you know, you went in happy, she was lying, and then she showed her true colors, and the innocent guy got screwed. That's the story that every guy wants to sort of hear. That's the black and white. And any kind of um, gray area, which is where, where most of life happens, people like to think that that's the exception, that the nuance like, you know, we, we drifted apart or one of us got cancer or someone died or, you know, her, you know, her mother and father, like, uh, they, I don't know, they got killed in a car crash overseas and, uh, she had to, she wanted to drop everything and go. And I was an idiot and I didn't want to leave because I had this promotion at work and I regret it. I'm an asshole, but I don't want to admit it. Our marriage fell apart because I fucked up. Like it could be a million different things, but everyone wants to think that the guy goes in, um, happy, and he wants it to stay the same. And if anything changes, it's her fault. And, um, you know, it's it's a bit myopic. Well, it's not only that. If you think about the life cycle of any relationship, the breakup is the last thing that's on your mind. You're not going to remember the good times that were five or ten years ago. Because it doesn't matter how long the the supposed interaction takes place. At the start, that's when you're going to have all the highs. That's when you get to know someone. That's when something is novel. After a couple of months or weeks or, or years, that kind of goes out the window and you start having the routine. And then towards the end, it gets bad. So it's extremely hard to make the connection with the first week or the first day or the first month when everything was peachy. You're going to remember the routine, which just gets boring after a while. And, and you start missing it because you're just so used to it. And after that, you get the downward spiral of the, of the dissolution, which is going to be the thing that's uh, most active in your head. So it, it's unsurprising that they tend to focus on the last part. It usually takes the whole grieving period until you're finally able to look at it and say, well, you know what, I can finally... I can finally say that I'm uh, in a good position now and can have a proper view of what actually happened and how good it was. And now I can make a proper cause benefit analysis of the entire thing. One thing I just thought of is, you know, the cliche is saying that um, you can't make everyone happy. I sometimes think that uh, the guys trying to make these objective rules about life are trying to make everyone happy. Let's let's uh, have a black and white rule about the dynamics between men and women and what we sh or should all choose so that we're all happy, um, but then it negates you personally being happy because we know that anything in life that matters to you, whether it's your your stupid hobby, uh, something you're, you're into esoterically, or the esoteric woman you particularly fall for, whereas other guys think, well, what? no, she's just every woman, but to you, you want her to the exclusion of the world, right? Everyone's making rules to make everyone happy, but not themselves. But the kind of glib cliche, which is true, is that, you know, you've got to make, you, you can't make everyone happy. You have to make yourself happy first. And part of that is like your friend, you said, you went to his wedding. You're not going to say, well, objectively, man, I've got the answers. You're not going to be happy. She's going to leave you, hypergamy, women, blah, blah, blah. You know, you've got to, you, you have to, uh, unless you're sort of an egotist 
and um, and you've got no social tact. How many times do people actually go to a wedding? You know, when the priest says, if there's anyone out there who objects to this union, uh, put your hand up now or forever hold your peace or whatever. How many people actually put their hand up? And all all these extremist kind of people, oh, whether no, it- don't don't give them ideas, human. Come on, <laughs> you know there's there's gonna be the spurg out there that's gonna do that. Well, I'm I'm thinking like in the extreme parts of the manosphere, the church would be full of guys putting their hand up, but in real life, no one puts their hand up because people have sh- social tact. They realize there's a human being, an individual there. They're happy. You might. If they're your friend, um, just say, you know, are you sure if you know your friend, you, you, you know, people close to you will know if this person's actually uh, going in with their eyes open. Uh, and and the end of the, at the end of the day, no one can tell the future. And, and this is one way for people to become soothsayers, to sort of be able to predict the future. Well, yeah, I can predict the future if I do nothing. I can predict the future if I never take a calculated risk on happiness. Yes, realistically, I'll factor in there may be a chance of it failing. The more reasonable, level-headed and sober I go into it with my experience and my ability to say no to women and all of that is the less of a chance that it can happen. But if you factor in, yes, look, I'm a realist, it could happen. But the more realistic you go into into it, trusting your judgment, all of these kind of factors, th- this is a thing. I think it's too complicated for guys and too hard to sort of juggle in their heads are being about being uh, one patient, using their experience through that patience over time to actually trust yourself enough to make a decision that you're responsible for going forward with this person and then owning... Uh, any negative outcome like you you factor it in but if you expect it to happen you wouldn't go to the altar Th- these are these like very realistic human things that people don't want to talk about they want to make it completely safe where we're trying to predict the future in certainty and yes you can predict the future if you stay still lock yourself in a cage and do absolutely nothing nothing will happen to you but also nothing good might happen to you as well well, for, first of all, there are a couple of issues when it comes to that because you're you're already trying to predict the future, and when you do that, chances are that you're going to be right, and chances are that you're going to be wrong, and irrespective of how well informed you are, that doesn't mean that uh, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, you're going to be right. You can have all the data on your table; they can they can all point in a certain direction. And, and at the end, you could still be wrong. And ex- exceptions happen all the time. That's why we, we always say that, well, you know, it's an exception, but that's, that's outside of the norm, and you can't expect that to happen, and so on and so forth. But if it does happen, it means that there's a probability for it to exist in the first place. And just going by the... Just going by life, like, it's... It's just one of those things that humans used to do in the past. They always knew that there's um, there's a level of risk involved in everything that they do. And now it seems that at least the, the modern man just doesn't want any type of uh, uh, vitriol or um, discomfort in his life, which is just very weird to me because it doesn't matter what you do and when you do it, you're always going to have issues with everything in your life. Mm. You're going to have problems at school. You're going to have problems with your health. You're going to have problems with absolutely everything at one point. Yeah, maybe you'll get lucky and there'll be a couple of, uh, of instances where you'll, you'll never have issues, maybe with your job, with your education or, or so on. But at the end of the day, gi- given a big enough time scale, something will go wrong. And, you were walking through life with the idea that uh, everything is going to go out the window. Well, that, that doesn't mean anything. It, it doesn't make you a, a clairvoyant. It, it just means that you're stating a fact of life. And that, that doesn't make you special. 
it's the same as saying, well, you know what? I bet you're going to breathe tomorrow. Well, thank you, genius. Like I do that every day. Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, in, in regards to the, the comments uh, under the recent chat, um, especially that you and Pete left, I really couldn't uh, disagree with uh, either one of you. You were both talking good points. Um, you were just describing different things from different angles. And at the end of the day, like the positive I saw is that at the, like there is no right answer. You need to accumulate all these points of views, which are logical. You take into account all these different you know, um, perspectives and realities. And then you, you need to sort of you know, say, well, I'm not as risk averse in this thing as say Pete is and or I'm I don't care about this like Karu does at all. Um, I want to do this and those guys don't give a crap about it. So you kind of you look at all this information, which is great. And I think this is where the guys tussle. We we think we should all come to some kind of consensus, but all we're doing is rel relaying the realities out there, you know, like a big buffet in front of us. And then you go up there with your plate and your your tongs and you start putting things on your plate that you want rather than saying well i don't know what i'm going to eat you guys pick for me we we need to have a set menu for everyone and that's not the case you know the the, the manosphere is a buffet of great information and you basically go out there you go there with a plate and uh, a spoon and you and you put whatever's on your plate and you know you're responsible for you for what you put on your plate and and what you go back to next time well, that, that's part of the beauty of the discussion, because I, I'm i going to be the first one that's going to recognize that I had a very specific environment where I grew up. I'm also lucky enough to where I, uh, I interact with a great many people on a day-to-day -day basis. So <clears throat> when I go out, and I think even Stardust mentioned this in one discussion, you go out and you see average people being together with average people. Some of them look happy, some of them not so much. Whether whether the manosphere likes to, likes what's going on out there or not, there are still people having relationships out there. And looking at at the at the landscape and just telling to yourself that oh, all of these guys must be miserable. All of these guys must be getting screwed in some way or another. I think that that's just a bit, uh, it's a bit facetious and I don't think it's a, it's a good image of, of reality. I think that things are more, more balanced. I think I mentioned this to you in a discussion or not, <clears throat> because there's this obsession now with, with lookism everywhere. And in the circles that I kind of uh, roll around in, I sometimes I see guys that are below fives and they have really normal looking women with them. Sometimes they're above their league. Sometimes they're not. But if you really pay attention to the guy, he has other qualities that the, that the specific woman likes. And it's not necessarily the things that the manosphere will automatically point at is like, Oh, look, he has a Lamborghini. He has a, he has a ton of money. Sometimes the guy is just an exceptional conversationalist. Other times he's funny like you can't even imagine. I think I mentioned this to you and Boffin in, in a previous chat. I went to one of my clients and uh, it, it's run by a, by a couple. Uh, and the guy is extremely overweight. He, he's tall. I'll give him that. He's not, he, he's not deformed in any way, shape, or form. He's an average guy, but he's extremely overweight. But he's one of the funniest guys that you ever, ever meet. And this, and this girl absolutely fawns all over him. Even though he's overweight, even though he doesn't look like the, like the chat in the gym and so on and so forth. Sure, you can always say that that's an exception. But just looking at the landscape... You'll see normal people with normal people. You'll see exceptions. And then you'll also see the bitter outcasts of society. And I'm guessing that if we're completely honest, that's who the minority actually is. And just because you're maladaptive or you don't want to admit to some faults of your own doesn't mean that everything out there is fucked. And I think that's one of the pitfalls that a lot of... Uh, 
a lot of the guys that consume this kind of content tend to fall in. Because let's be honest, if you have one, two, three, four bad experiences, it's always easy to take all of that and say, well, you know what, everything is fucked and everybody else is the issue. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, and also, like trying to um, come up with these formulas, even if we worked it out, uh, we worked out a list of formulas, you know, whether it's, you know, the PUAs have their go to the gym and all that stuff, which um, is practical. And, and, and it does do a bit for guys who are sort of stuck at zero. The point is, even if you've got this great list of objectively what all men should do, you still run into the fact that the individual guy, you and me, will go, well, I'm not going to do A, B, C. Like, I, I can't be bothered. I won't do this. So, again, it comes down to personal choice. So, for instance, you mentioned the guy who's um, funny, and he's got that very um, esoteric quality. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe he just gravita gravitated towards comedy and wit when he was younger and he just developed it. The, those, some of those qualities that people have, like humor and wit, um, are things that you're either just uh, in an unexplained way drawn to. And then you, you see someone else who has it. And sometimes it's sour grapes. It's like, why does he have that and I don't? I would like to have the stuff I see but without taking into account who he is. So you see someone who's rich, who's got a Lamborghini, um, you don't ask yourself, well, what's his personality like and, and what what is he naturally like and driven towards to be able to get that? Yes, he's worked hard, but you have to also take into account the things that you have as a, a kind of unique person. You could have a list of things in the manosphere that you can try and do all of, but if your life is going to be hell trying to achieve all of those and be really good at them, on the one hand, you could say, well, it's your fault. But no one has to be a perfect guy. You, you just need to be honest about wh where you enjoy life. For instance, I like drawing, right? Someone else might see something admirable in the results or success or whatever that I have in drawing or making videos or whatever, right? But you can't sort of say, well, that's where happiness lies. Lies if you're not addicted to what I'm addicted to in a really nerd-like fashion. That's not really explainable. You know, I, I don't have a plan. I'm just obsessed in a certain area in life. I just like certain things a lot, and then you start to develop skills in those areas, like the guy who's funny, like the guy who makes a lot of money and stuff like that. So. Uh, even if we had this subjective list, you'd still run into the problem of people saying, well, that's not me. I'm lazy. I can't be bothered. Oh, you know what? In the end, we all die. So what's the point? Um, people would find excuses anyway. So, you know. There, there are a couple of points that I, that I want to address there. And uh, the first one is the guy with the Lamborghini. I mean, he, he either worked hard or engaged in trafficking, depending on who your model in life is <laughs> and uh yeah i mean <clears throat> there are a couple of ways to reach that level of success and depending on the type of person that you are and what, what your values and morals are i guess uh well so some people are just willing to do certain uh, sacrifices to engage in coitus and uh i i think that uh some of them aren't as good as the others but let, let's address a bit the memes that the, that the manosphere has because I've uh, I've engaged with this point with uh, with somebody else. I call it the go to the gym, work out, uh, get money, and, and so on and so forth. I forgot if I made this point in the in the chat that we had with Pete, but these are very um, all encapsulating solution, and each solution that you, each solution that you present needs to have a bit of specificity to the guy that you're talking to. When, when you say go and work out more, I, I'm sorry, but that's going to apply to 90% of the population. It, everybody can benefit from working out a bit more. Everybody can benefit from having a better financial situation. However, that doesn't mean that if a specific guy comes and talks to you and asks, and asks, and asks you what he should do, that should automatically be the answer. 
because you don't know who you're talking to. This guy could be somebody that's stuck in a bed with an iron lung and he wants to have a family or whatever the hell and you're telling him, well, you know what, you should go out and work and, and build a business. It's like, mate, I, I can't get out of bed, I have an iron lung or I, or I have brittle bone disease or I have anything under the sun. And this is something that is completely ignored by the manosphere. It's just let's address the lowest common denominator. Let's address things that are um, that are going to be beneficial to everybody. And it's the easiest way to be right. Because for the vast majority of people, they're going to go to the gym. They're going to get that dopamine hit. It's going to be better for them. They're going to have better sleep, better digestion. You, you know the benefits of working out. And suddenly you fall into this idea that the content creator that you're watching is automatically right a bunch about a bunch of other things that he may have absolutely no idea on or that weren't particularly well thought out just because you have that type of feedback loop where he was right about one or two or, or three things that can be universally regarded as solutions. And, and, and let's be honest at the same time, like if you're the kind of guy that needs to be told to work out so you so you're going to feel better or to go to sleep at a reasonable hour you you have bigger issues than worrying about the woman that you want to get there's other stuff that you need to put in order before you get to that level if you want to view it from a maslow's hierarchy of uh, of needs like you you're at the bottom of the um, of the pyramid you, you can just get your shelter and get your food, but even that you can't do with, uh, with proper efficiency because of all of the uh, mishaps that you're pointing out with your life. So I, I can't, t I'm sorry, but I can't take you seriously if, if you're at that level. Look, now, uh, if you have just something ahead. I wanted to touch on because like um, something you said earlier before we stray too far away from the point, then, then kind of continue on what you're saying. Um, when you when you look at the, you were talking about this all encompassing sort of um, uh, basic stuff, yeah, we can all agree. Like health, you know, eat well, move, exercise, right? That's the base level Maslow's. And then I'm sure there are the equivalent um, base level Maslow's of trying to do the right thing in terms of dating between men and women. And it's fine talking about that. But what you mentioned, I wanted, I wanted to sort of uh, um, really uh, drop on a point here, is that the guys avoiding the, the specific personal, it's almost like, I don't know if it's because they've lost the ability to converse one-on-one -on -one with each other, that they, they just talk in generalizations about groups, whereas all of this stuff always leads back to you specifically, what you want, and they're always trying to perfect... A, a, a you know a solution on the horizon for everyone and and it's so stupid because uh, as you touched on before if someone were to ask me uh human what kind of microphone should i buy i'm not just gonna give them my favorite i am gonna exactly. say i'm gonna say well do you game um yeah uh, what's your voice like like there's all these specific um esoteric particular things like you know, oh, I'm going to buy a car. What kind of car? I want to buy a mouse or a keyboard. Well, what do you do? What do you need it for? I'm going to buy a, a, a notebook for fuck's sake. Well, do you write? Do you draw? Like they're vastly different things. You know, are you better off with a keyboard and a laptop? Are you better off with a sketch pad? And it's so stupid to think that we can make, we can't make one size fits all answers with something as um, specific as like even buying a, 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 a notepad uh, to someone. We need to find out exactly what they're going to use it for, what kind of person they are. Do they like A4? Do they like small? Do they write big landscape, portrait, whatever? And then to think when it comes to human relationships, one of the most important decisions you're going you're gonna to make and the dance continually keeps going on, you've got to find the compatibility of being able to match the person with the choice that they might want to make. But we're pretending that we're going to say, no, no, there's a one size fits all solution. All we care about is the bottom Maslow's of dating. And that's all we need to uh, care about. Well, then what do I, sp then what do I pick specifically? 
Why should I pick Jane apart from Nancy, apart from the sea of billions of women out there? And that's what we're avoiding. Well, I, I think that the example that you brought up with the, with the notebook is, is perfect because it's, it's something that everybody can relate to. I wanted to bring up the example of us building your, your PC, but I think that the, the notepad one is better because whether you draw or you write, you're still going to use a pen or a pencil. Mm. But depending on what you enjoy more, the tools are, are, going to vast, are going to be vastly different. Some people are going to prefer the, the softer LEDs, and they're going to like that. If you write, you're not really going to want a soft LED. You're not really going to want a soft LED. You're going to want something harder or a ballpoint pen. Like the, the tool is the same, but your use case is going to vary significantly from one person to the other. And not to mention all the other complexities of personal preferences. What type of paper do you like? Do, do you want it to also be able to handle ink? Do, and then, then all of the things that you can think about. Do, do you want it to be... Uh, do you want the paper to smudge? Do you want it to be easily erased? And so on and so forth. So e even for something so simple, you can think of a myriad of things that can go wrong, that you can that can go right, that you're going to like, that you're going to hate. And yet you look at quasi the most important decision that you're going to have in your life, and you're willing to have a black and white answer over it. That, that is just baffling to me without having any sorts of nuance when it comes to it. And, and going back to what we were talking before, we kind of brought up the subject, like the specificities of the hobbies matter because since we brought up the, the, the notebook analogy, I mean, just think about the things that we talk about when we're in a VC and it's private. Like we can sit there and we can talk about the new tablet that you just bought and we can talk about it for two or three hours and spurg about how you're using it, what your use case is, what you like about it, what you hate about it, how, how it's impacting your life. And something so simple can have a knock-on effect with everything in your life and how you, how you engage with note-taking and with, with how you organize yourself. And again, something that's important to you, you give very little thought to and say, well, you know what, this has to be black and white. Yeah. And, and there's something, um, there's something about feeling alive when you really are interested in something and you want to try something out and you take those little personal risks just because they excite you rather than saying, look, I, before I get excited, let me ask the manosphere before I decide to say hi hello to her or pick this woman or, 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 or test something out and use my own judgment. I won't use my judgment. I'll I'll um, what's I'll defer to the Borg. You know, I'll let uh, them talk to me. Yeah. Well, that, that's a type of, of of authority or opinion that I I really loathe, and it probably has to do with my upbringing because I had not very controlling parents, but parents that really liked to know what I was doing, where I, where, where I was going out with whom, how long I would stay out and, and so on and so forth. But after a certain age, you reach a point where you kind of understand, I don't need to defer to other people. I need to have a bit of independence. And if it's an important choice or something that you don't have experience with, uh, something that might impact you financially or, or something that might ruin you or, or if it's a very big decision that's going to change your trajectory in life, then it's fine to go and ask other people. But some of the questions that you see posed in the manosphere, even in your even in your live streams, like, oh, hey, human, there's this girl talking to me. What should I do? Should you, should I tell her that she's hypergamous or, or should I start talking to her? It's like, mate, like, how about you have a bit of independence and self-thought? It's it, it's just baffling, and it's not it, it's not the fact that they ask for uh, for guidance that to me is um, is surprising. It's that they ask a complete stranger that doesn't know anything about them. And it, sure, it's like just I, so I, weird. I, I get it, um, and sometimes I need to check myself too. Like when you've done that for a while, and I've done that too listen to people better than me who have at least a solution, whereas before I was completely lost. And it comes from, you know, 
fatherless homes, the wrong kind of mentorship today. I mean, no male mentorship where the, the female voice is the only one that's predominantly heard in the public. So, you know, guys getting the wrong message, it's really hard. So I know these the sort of walls in front of guys and the ability for them to make mistake after mistake because of what's out there. Uh, and it is baffling, but it's we have to remember sometimes, at least I think this, is that I've come through a lot and I've and I've really tried hard to be better um, reflecting on the world and like I'm not perfect, but it's baffling to me now, but 15 or 20 years ago, it was less baffling and I was on the same page. I was doing some of the same things. So I, I kind of need to sort of like drop that in there. So it is, it's, it's frustrating to me now because I, I can't talk like I did 20 years ago and I can sympathize with those guys. I, I'm not going to live in that space anymore. I can, you know, try and uh, sit around that campfire and talk as myself to anyone who wants to listen and converse. And I'll be respectful if a conversation's, uh, you know, if you drop into a conversation where or everyone who's around the campfire is talking the same way you were talking 20 years ago, or someone who's, you know, had an idyllic life and all of a sudden they got, you know, uh, blindsided by divorce and she took everything from him, right? And so even if he's a 50-year-old guy, he's on the same page as the 20-year-old guys because he was blind to all of this until now. So like we kind of need to be aware of where guys are at, but certainly I, I'm sort of frustrated and I don't have any time for those kind of conversations anymore. Well, I, I agree with everything you said and obviously there's a bit of context there that needs to be added. Uh, and using your own example, when you were young and you had an issue, I, I doubt that you went outside and picked a random person off the streets, which is what essentially these guys are doing, except that they're picking people off of YouTube and asking them, what would you do in my situation? You'd probably go ask your father, you'd ask your mother, maybe you'd ask your sister, and you'd probably ask your friend. And all, all of those people are, are individuals that know a little bit or a lot about you so they kind of have uh, an idea of how you're going to act in a specific situation and what they say at least in my opinion holds holds a bit more value than somebody that doesn't even know what the color of your hair is it's if you would be asking a technical question then i have no issue with it if they'd be asking you something about drawing or editing a video, or or color composition, or anything else. But that, that's the type of advice that I think you can give. But at the same time, if they ask you, well, human, should I go to engineering, or should I go to art school? Like, fuck, man, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, when you mentioned, like, I would have gone to my father, see, that's... Um, that's the specifics of conversations we need to have more and more of. Um, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I never could because my father was there, but he wasn't. He was like the orbiter around the family. He was a great guy, but he was very distant. He didn't really mentor me very much. He was in his own little bubble doing his own thing. He was the pr protector, provider. Um, he answered when you talked to him, but he was a friendly, warm guy. But he, he wasn't conversationally um, open like I am, for instance, right? Uh, that's just the way I'm wired. So again, I didn't really have a male mentor. I only had, had a male mentor in my father, which I loved and respected purely by observation, not by mentorship and rhetoric. Um, so again, we're, we're all kind of different. Um, so I can recognize all those guys, but at the end of the day, like I, I've been saying more and more in, in these, these uh, current times and, and my videos is, it just all boils down to, are you sick of what you've been doing over and over again? Yeah. And do you get to a point where, you know, fuck it, let me at least try something else that is still in line with what I would want to do or try. It's a bit risky, but, you know, it, it's it, at best, it may be a vacation that I can come back from with a story or it may be a new path because I'm really sick of where I am at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I'm not trying to, to ignore the, the circumstances that, that these guys have or that anyone's had in, in their specific life. 
I, I'm just saying that a lot of the times you have better options when it comes to, to asking for advice. And don't get me wrong. I mean, if the only person that is going to listen to you is uh, is the cookie cutter internet answer that you might get from somebody that you throw a donation at, then just go for it. But at, at the same time, it's for, for a group of people that say they have this great degree of rationalism and introspection and wisdom, and for the group of people that say that they built society and they're constantly keeping society running, it, it just seems a bit funny to me that they need to ask these types of questions. Well, look, uh, I've said it over and over again. I, I created my YouTube channel because I needed to do something different. I needed to find answers. I couldn't just have this herd of cats in my head. Um, I couldn't talk to my then girlfriend. I could. I didn't. Like I said, uh, my my father was there, but not verbally. Uh, I I need to make sense of things conversationally and verbally. I'm, a, you know, I, I I'm that kind of person. Uh, the the my mother and sister the the women in my life love them, but again they're women and they they're always self referential and they find it hard to see things and if not impossible sometimes to see things from another person's point of view. So again, you get to the point. You, you, we can talk about all this stuff in front of us. Like I, I could have just stopped at my family and like what my father my father and my sister and my mother and the women i dated and said like i can't do anything and keep the herd of cats in my head uh and translate that to online discussions on you know comment sections uh and and keep it nice and safe there but at some point it's like my external life is worse and worse so what's the choice I either stop living externally and and just burrow further and further into my own head and online behind an avatar, or I can realize that just that's, you know, just objectively speaking, that is hiding. Perhaps that's not going to fix the issues I'm having, because if I'm honest with myself, X, Y, and Z is the problems I'm having and their external problems, my relationship with women and the world and choices and things like that. You know, I'm not feeling a certain way because I'm making it up. Sure, sometimes you can have down days and sometimes you can feel good for no reason. But a lot of the issues that come up again and again, for instance, say with women, that's a repeatable thing with an object outside of you in the world. Um, and those kind of things, you can ignore them and come up with a lot of word salad and online, you know, really intelligently pontificate about like, you know, and, you know, Kierkegaard said blah, blah, blah. And it's like, who gives a fuck if you're not actually practicing what Kierkegaard said and actually testing if it's true or it can help you? You know, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard or Kierkegaard could have been smart, but in terms of applicability in my, in my life, um, it's shit. It doesn't work. But the only way you're going to see if something works, and, and it, it gets down to, you know, if... If, if someone wants to be honest enough whether or not they just enjoy this stuff, talking about it and feeling good about the discussion and being entertained, or they're frustrated and, and they really want it to make a difference in their lives. And I don't think a lot of people are interested enough or they don't care enough. They're fine enough with stopping at online theory and discussion and creating their little, you know, um, Lord of the Rings worlds in their heads and online uh, with relation to men and women? It's always easy to live in the fantasy because as, you, as you've just pointed out with the, with, with the small description that you had, when, when you reached a point and where you, when you understood what the issue was, you had to, stay, you had to take steps to course correct. And it, it doesn't matter what the proposed solutions from 10, 20, 40 people were, you still had to get to get out there and say, okay, I need to stop doing this and I need to start doing this. And from this point on, I'm going to make the following things work in my life or I'm not going to do anything about them. And that's something that you need to actively do. It's a call to action. It's not a call to let's debate this, uh, this topic until it's so diluted down that you're going to be uh, squabbling over details that ultimately are irrelevant. And, and that's the big distinction between spending your time in, in one of these manosphere echo chambers and actually giving a damn about your life. Because without action, 
all you're doing is stagnating. Well, it's fine to have a discussion and to try and uh, think about repercussions. But at the same time, if, if, as you said, it doesn't lead to anything practical, what's the point? Well, I was going to say, and like, I'm sure it's true for most of us, uh, but uh, I wanted to ask Boffin as well. Like, isn't, isn't it true that no matter all, all the stuff we knew, the conversations we had with our friends, our mates and stuff, would if you could go back in time, you would have taken action on the things you knew much earlier. And some of these guys, they they just keep accumulating information. And the, the real shame and the frustration is that they can never bring themselves to do anything different. They have uh, they only know how to exercise certain muscles. And then sometimes all they're doing is exercising a safe muscle over and over again. And isn't it true that if we could go back in time, we would just take action sooner, more often, and just keep moving forward and kind of not perfecting our choices and getting to somewhere where we're really, you know, happy with whatever choice we make, whether it's where we moved, the job we took, the woman we were with. Uh, obviously, people change and things like that, like notwithstanding that. But isn't it true that we, through action, that would have made more sense of life rather than just staying in theory for years and years and years and years? I, I think that was probably the great advantage of growing up before the internet there was a complete lack of information we we were basking in our own ignorance so the only choice we had really was to take what little bit of information we could collect from you know father cousins friends and then go out in the real world and try something it it really was clumsy trial and error, uh, operating from near ignorance. And, and paradoxically, I, I think that was advantageous. Yeah. Well, look, we, we, we are hamstrung with like a myriad of like uh, with uh, choice paralysis today. And even the information I'd say in the manosphere is choice paralysis. Um, and, and it's just nice to keep stirring the pot of all of this interesting information that is true. It's like all, all of us guys are like stirring all these truths in a big pot. And it's like, let's just keep putting in more ingredients and salt and perfecting this stew. And it's like no one's kind of, you know, dipping a big spoon and pouring into their, pouring it into their plate and walking away. Everyone's just around the pots stirring and cooking up this soup all the time. Yeah, as if the conversation has become the end goal. Well, what did, um, I can't remember who it was, Alan Watts, was it? The menu is not the meal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I, um, I read through some of the um, back and forth between um, Karu and uh, Pete under the recent chat we all had. And um, yeah, both of you guys made really good points. I, I don't really think you guys disagreed very much you were just touching on different things that you both saw that was important in si in the similar topic um that's what i read so of of course you both got different perspectives and different lives as you said hikaru so of course you're going to have different things that pop out that stand out and that are important to you and that again is the beauty of well as you hear yourself talking about these things and writing them down and really getting in your, on your own podium and shaking your fist at these things that are important, what's right and what's wrong, it should tell you then you've actually got to start practicing those things and not just shaking them on your own in front of a computer screen. Well, that, that used to be the, um, the, the beauty of the manosphere because you would have people like Spetsnaz, like Stardust, Coltane, and each of them would have a, a different perspective, and that's what they would share. But now it's just cookie-cutter answers all the way down. It doesn't matter who you listen to. They all have the same type of playback material, and you just get it expressed in different forms. And, and to me, that's, that, that's just valueless. It, it reaches a point where it becomes caricature. And it, it just doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't appeal to me anymore, and I can't... I, I, I just can't relate to to mindless content. It, it's it, it's astrology for men, and that and that's what it's become. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at some of the what the most popular stuff is. It's now gone from just the cookie cutter, go to the gym, you know, and get rich. The popular stuff is TikTok stuff now. And so the men are being informed by, you know, a, a, a guy's head in front of a TikTok video behind him, and all he's doing is pulling faces to reacting to a woman being stupid. So she's stay, saying idiotic stuff, and he's just pulling faces, think like showing that this is ridiculous, she's being stupid, and that's the video. There's no analysis. There's no talking about why it's wrong. There's no discussion of ethics and morals and why we've got that expression on our face that she is stupid. Other than she's dumb, we're right. And women are doing the same thing. So the manosphere now is is devolved from even going to the gym, making money, um, you know, uh, self-esteem, um, self-reflection, all that sort of stuff. It's gone. The, the words have even gone. It's just become TikTok. That's what they're interested in. It's what sells. It's what people like to see. It's easy, digestible content. And... <laughs> The intellectual discussion left the left the space a long time ago. I think it was Stardust that said the McDonaldification of MGTOW, if, if I'm not mistaken, and, and this was in regards to a content creator. And now we're at a we're at an even lower point than that. Like we we've gone past McDonald's and we're just eating the weeds that we see on the on the side of the road. <laughs> Well, it's now just- whenever I I read a deranged childish comment in my comment section like you can't always tell now that it's someone young or someone old back in the day you used to tell by what they'd write but now you can't and i just click on the avatar and you look at their channel and you just look at the 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 um the channels that they're subscribed to and it's like yeah okay you're you're entertained by this tiktok manosphere uh side of the internet on youtube like stop coming in here and dropping like so your so-called truth bombs by insulting me. Um, you're going to get the results of this life. And I can see those kind of guys coming back like 10 or 15 years ago, wanting to be serious now philosophically in the same way women come back in their 30s and 40s wanting to be serious about having a baby. This goes back to a point that came up in the chat that we had with Pete. It depends what type of bait you're using. And if these guys waste their time looking on TikTok and, and commenting on these women, most likely these are the women that they're attracted to. You, you're, I, I see no reason why you would watch somebody like Tess Holiday on your computer unless there's something there. Well, I, either you're doing it for the money and you're doing it for, for other reasons, or you're interested in somebody like Tess Holiday and that's what you want to have in your, in your life. So you're looking at what she's interested in, what she's saying. And I'm sorry. I mean, if you're looking at TikTok chicks and then you're surprised that uh, the, the quality of females that you're finding or you're attracted to is that low, like, well, why is that some sort of a, some sort of a shock for you? Well, that's like, another, looking- well, that's the kind of a, a, a side topic. It's related, but if uh, you're the product of, you know, how they say the five people you spend your time with, but I just think it's, you're the product of where you spend most of your time because that's a relationship you're having. So if you're online, you find it very hard to discern between what is a fetish and what is like something that you really know is good for you. Um, You know, there's an attractive girl. I like her in real life. We smile. I'm drawn to her. She makes me happy, yada, yada, yada. That's different from I never meet any girl. All I'm attracted to is this weird fetishistic manga-esque type of cartoon representation of a woman. Hey, 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 I take offense to that. <laughs> but you kind of know the difference. We, You can still have a discussion in terms of what makes a good girlfriend compared to what you're fetishizing. But I think most people can't now. That, that's definitely a part of it. But as you said, it, it's not just the five people you have around. It's what you do on a daily basis and what you consume. And I, I would go even beyond that. It's not just what you consume. It's what you actually have around you. Because you can sit here in, in your home and you can look at K-pop every day of your life. You're not going to be in Korea just because you look at K-pop your, your entire day. When you go out there and you go to work or you go to school or, or wherever, 
you're still going to have to interact with the people that compose the the society that you're in. So it, it doesn't matter what your the specific uh, well, let's use the same word that you did. Your specific fetishes are because ultimately, uh, unless you decide to pick up all of your all your all of your stuff and move, you're still going to have to interact with the people in Europe or Australia or wherever the hell you reside. And just wishing that someday you're going to have some wild female appear from the east at your doorstep that's going to see the good in you and and all of the qualities that nobody else can see that that's uh that's lunacy and uh, boffin touched on you know we always talk about back in the day but not necessarily as um you know old timers but because things were demarcated by lines very clearly so if you picked up a book um you know when you're in that headspace there was a bit you know there was a demarcation between living in the headspace of uh, reading a book and then, you know, unplugging from that and then you're in the real world where you're saying hello to people in your house and having that intimate relationship. And then there was a line between your your home and then out in the street when you said, um, how are you going? Good day, blah, 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 to a, someone in the street. So and, and there was a same between, there's a demarcation between children, adults, elderly. Now online... It's just blurred from when you're born to when you die. It's kind of like anything goes. Like, you know, do I go after young women? Do I go after old women? Do I respect the elderly? Do I respect that? What do I say? I don't know. I don't know how to talk. Everything's just the soup mixed. And there's no demarcation. There's no compartmentalization of knowing how I act here, knowing how I act there. So like we said before... You would say, okay, my fetish is this. When I want to enjoy that, I go here. R with my family, I, I, I modify myself and I'm, you know, my glasses are different, if you will. My personality is always there, but how I operate is different. Like, and these things work. But now it's like, no, no, I just act like a five-year-old. I haven't grown. I don't know how to socialize in. Th there's no compartmentalized places in life where I need to learn to socialize anyway. I don't talk to anyone. I only know how to feel in front of a screen and then I spit out some words that are incomprehensible to the in the English language and then I wonder why I have all these problems relating. At least relating was clearer because there were lines between things and there were scripts by which you could relate fairly to people, dating, elderly, there was respect and stuff. Now there's no respect, there's no lines, there's no hierarchy. Uh, there's no difference between young, middle-aged, old experience. You know, someone who's 18 writes a, writes a biography and they know everything. You know, they're an expert on YouTube and they're 18 years old. And because they've got a million followers, everyone thinks they're, they've got experience. So it, it's just very, it's, it's harder today for the young person. There's so many things making it hard. But their attitude as well makes it even harder. I kind of disagree with that. I mean, you, you can say that it's uh, it's harder for the younger person, but it's also easier for the younger person at the same time. I, I don't know how many of them don't have access to antibiotics, to drugs, to things that keep them alive. Yeah, but they're to, practical, to functional things. I'm, I'm talking relational things to human beings and life in general, not... not um, not not where you're a sort of a, a lemming on life support where, you know, you've got health care, you know, you've got, uh, you know, five different choices of Coke and Pepsi and stuff like that. It's not, you know, you've got a lot of uh, stupid and pointless choice and you've got a lot of stuff that makes you, you know, healthier and alive and you live longer it's just the quality of life is i think the big bugbear of uh, most of us this is why all the, what all the discussions are about it's the quality of life and why it's slipped so much but, but here's why why i think that's a bit uh, that's a bit weird because th they still go for the same rigmarole that you did and i did when we were young Gr granted there are a lot of differences between uh your generation, my generation, boffins, and uh, and the current one. However, they still go through school. They still go through high school. They still go for college. All of those are places where 
at least in theory, you're supposed to develop your social skills to build a friend circle and so on and so forth. The, but the fact of the matter is that they choose not to do that, or at least the ones that you encounter online, because... <clears throat> don't you, don't you think the environment I... makes a big difference? It would be the equivalent, like um, social media today and the way people relate between each other, which again, we can agree is not optimal, would be equivalent to uh, in the days of myself and Boffin, the like our parents or society dropping in uh, deranging psychedelics into our water. So we'd have to contend with psychology imposed upon us trying to deal with, well, you know, we've got food, we've got the, like, you know, a lot of stuff in life, but we're hamstrung by the psychological apps aspect that's, uh, you know, by the environment we have to deal with. So we didn't have to contend with um, the psychological aspect as, as much. We, we didn't have to do as much psychological heavy, heavy lifting. No, I, I completely agree with what you said. But that's a battle that every generation has to take. Like your gener like Boffin's generation had certain things that they that they had easier in their lives, and they also had things that they had to adapt to. They're the ones that had to adapt to the growing pace of technology, and so on and so forth. Like go go back far enough, and you'll see that for well, what's the um, what's the meme that that the older guys say? Well, I, I never get the younger generations because X, Y, and Z. And the newer generations, they're watching too much TV. And before that, it's all that they're reading too many books and so on and so forth. You will always have complaints that what's going on with society is, uh, is going down the drain and that the current generation is screwed because of the things they're doing and so on and so forth. There are different challenges. Maybe the current generation has... Um, <clears throat> the problems that they're facing are maybe a bit blown out of proportion, not blown out of proportion are, are bigger than the ones that previous generations faced, but they're still going through the same kind of social dynamics. The difference is that with the ac access to their internet, they choose to be isolated because it, w what's easier to, to go out and try to play a, a, a match of football with 10 other guys on the pitch when you're the guy that isn't really athletic or is it easier to go back home and play world of Warcraft where you're going to get some form of, of a dopamine hit? Cause back in the day you didn't have that choice. You either went out and you played football or you stayed in the house and you drew. And yeah. But, but also again, I don't want to keep harping on the environment, but if the only place you're going to be with friends is on the football pitch and going out there, that's it's, it's easy to, you know, if, it's logical. Like I either stay in inside and I'm not around anyone, but if I want to socialize, I have to go out there. Now, what are you going to do? Like no one's out on the football pitch. Uh, the, you know, they're closing down parks. Uh, sports are going downhill. You, It's very hard uh, to socialize in a healthier way like an older generation just because everyone is socializing as avatars online. Um, so I, I don't want to belabor that point, but I just want to acknowledge that that's, that's a very big, it's not even a speed hump, it's a wall that uh, Boffin and I really didn't have. Oh, I know, I know, and I was, getting, I was getting precisely to that point. If you see that all of these things are going down the drain, then you're going to have to find different solutions for socialization. And mm. you, can either, you can either pick to stay on the internet with random people, or you can choose to do things where people force themselves to socialize. For example, uh, and, and I mentioned this to, to Boffin a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, some of these guys complain that they never interact with women and so on and so forth. Well, I've never, I haven't seen this advice being given in a very, very long time. Why don't you sign up for dance? Why don't you sign up for a cooking class? Why don't you sign up to a place where people are paying money to be there and to learn something? And just by dint of being there, you're going to have to socialize and you're going to have new people around you. Because if all you're doing, as I said before, is you're at home and you're playing WoW all day or CS or whatever the hell you're doing, 
you're, you're never going to get that human interaction. And if, as you said, parks and everything else is being closed down, well, one of the solutions is, as I said, go to a dance class. Yeah, you may think that you're a clown. Oh, that, that's, so, that's so feminine. That's whatever. But if that's the only option that you have for genuine socialization, it might be a good idea. Yeah, it's, there's no point sort of you're in an environment with realistically there are virtually no women like, you know, sitting in front of your screen at home. There are no physical women around you. And also in the virtual environment, there are virtually no women around you. Uh, rather than saying like, well, if I'm frustrated that I don't have a girlfriend, maybe I should take my laptop and game at a coffee shop. That'll up my chances. Exactly. Exactly. But, but the thing is that they want nothing to change. Something magical needs to appear. And it, it, it's just hoodoo. Even let, let me pose to you this question. Let's say that everything in the manosphere is true. You go to the gym, you work out, you have a, 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 an 88 pack, right? You don't have a six pack, you have an 88 pack. You, you're built like a, like a goddamn tank. You're perfectly proportional. You look like a model. You, you, you strike it rich. You're as rich as Elon Musk. And then you go out and you can't talk to people because you're unsocialized as hell. You're going to have a good proportion of, uh, of ladies out there that are going to look at you and are going to want to be next to you because either you're a, you're a baby doll that they like or because you have, an exorb you have so much money that they think they're going to get a, a free meal ticket. But that doesn't mean that just because your chances of finding something go up, it's going to be the thing that you like or it's going to be a thing of value. Because if you can't communicate and the person you're interacting with you that's interacting with you can't communicate on your level, the thing that you're doing is pointless. It, it's genuinely just using one another. And as you said on, on multiple occasions, you're just using one another as bodies or as wallets or, or as anything else. And sure, you can make the, the argument that on a certain level, we're all using each other, but it depends what you're getting out of the thing as well. Yeah, and, and fundamentally, uh, what's uh, holding most guys back is will and the black and white stats uh, that apply to the sort of uh, sleepwalking normies out there. If you're applying them to yourself, you will be them. But the point, like I've talked to some very intelligent guys in the manosphere, some of them who have actually channels, and I, I was struck by their their not inability but their disinterest in just liking what they like i've talked to some guys where i say well they'll ask me oh you know you've got a natural gift in drawing human or making videos or speaking or whatever like i didn't have a plan to become better i just saw something that was really cool and interesting and i just wanted to do it and you know i'd try this and try that and try different ways and get better and better and better and be smart about it but the amount of guys I talk to today that are very smart and their attitude is, well, if I'm not going to be the best, I won't try. I'm not doing it. I have to be the best. And I said, what happened to you just enjoying doing it? And you just know that you're going to be, you're going to get better in your own way and you're going to be your own expert in your own way, not an objective one, um, but you're going to be really good at it if you just have a subjective interest. And it's the same with women and stuff. It's like, well, here are the rules and here are the stats. Like, I don't give a fuck. I still like the kind of women I like and I want to be with them. Um, and that's all that counts. It, it just baffles me that, well, unless I'm the best at it, I'm not going to even try drawing. To me, it's the equivalent of, well, if my marriage doesn't work, I'm not going to date any women. It, it's just stupid to me. And may, maybe a lot of guys will say, well, I'm being stupid, uh, ridiculous, but I, I what what other point of life is there other than sort of selfishly um, and subjectively, but logically as well, like the sky is blue, gravity goes down, all that sort of stuff, right? But trying to read the terrain accurately and just doing whatever the fuck you want to do in the most intelligent, honest way with regard to the world out there. 
But these guys, unless they're Picasso, they're not going to pick up a brush, even though it's eating at them, that they want to do something. Because the idea of good enough doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But look at how they talk about anything. You, you need to be at the peak or in the top, I don't know, 10% or 5% of, of males to be successful. Well, if, if everybody would have the ability to do that, we wouldn't have a 5%. And, and even if, every, if, if everybody would have the potential to get there, then that 5% is going to get stratified again. And all of the guys that got to 5%, they're going to move down the ladder because, you know, the guy above you has slightly better defined abs, and now he's better than you. Like it, 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 it's just one of these things that, that they don't seem to, to get on a fundamental level. Like you can cl crawl up the hierarchy and people are going to crawl with you. That doesn't mean that the, um, that the top 5% as a, as a, what's the word I'm looking for as a, as a mathematical object changes, they're still going to be a top 5% and you're just going to have to, to keep, uh, to keep that position tooth and nail and constantly work for it. And, and, and going back to the point that I made, because look, look at somebody like Elon Musk. For, for all intents and purposes, he has a lot of, a lot of the qualities that the manosphere, quote-unquote manosphere, would, uh, would look at and say that this guy is a quote-unquote alpha male, right? Like he, he's, he's not fat, he's somewhat fit. I, I don't know if he's fit nowadays. I just remember an old picture of the guy. Uh, he has a. No, he's not. He's, he's not fit. No. Well, he, he he's probably not fit anymore. Let, let's say he was fit. At the same time, how many women do you think are going to bed Elon Musk just on the just on that data? Yeah, some fair. of them will, but you don't get a guaranteed result just because you do those things. You just improve your chances. And you know what? For some of you, it may just be a slight chance. It may be just it may just be a slight improvement instead of the leap that you're thinking it's going to be. Just to kind of add on to to what the the points that you two just made, I've noticed, and again, I I, I don't know how you quantify this, but I've noticed a lot of guys that I've talked to on Discord servers have a very uh, engineering like mindset. I think a lot of them are, you know, involved in some type of technical work and they tend to think like an engineer. And and one of the side effects of of that way of thinking is they they're they seem like they're constantly trying to minimize risk. And I I think a lot of them battle with trying to absorb and utilize all this information to the point where they think they can get it down to close to zero risk. I think they've convinced themselves that if they work at it long enough and digest enough of this information and think about it and talk about it long enough, because they've all heard the horror stories. Oh, they're, they're, drown they're drowning in this information, I think. Like, I think the, 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 the mental... Um the, the archetypical mental sort of way they're looking at it is that there's a sea of information and a sea of women and they're just dropped in it uh, rather than sort of them, you know, it's kind of just overwhelming to them. Um, so it, it's a choice to simplify these things. It's a choice to simplify how you want to start um, absorbing it and maybe writing it down, you know, what is important to me, that sort of stuff people don't, like a lot of people really resist you talking that way because it's very, it, it may come off as self-helpy, like, you know, a lot of the self-help, you know, on one column, write down what you want, on the other column, write down the, the pros and cons of relationships and stuff. That all implies, okay, now I'm actually starting to become real about this and I have to make a choice. It's no longer theoretical. It's no longer fun discussion. I'm actually putting it to paper. I'm making columns. I'm taking the statistics and seeing how it applies to my life. I'm, you know, so taking that leap to no longer have fun swimming in the ocean of manosphere knowledge to getting out and sort of, exactly. you know, re really just holding what you can hold. You can't hold the ocean. Like, 
what matters to you and what can you use. And to some guys, it's boring. It's not fun. It means moving away from you know, all your friends online, because let's face it, like I've noticed that the, the more real I've gotten, the amount of friends in real life and especially online, the popularity of my channel, it shrinks. But then you have to realize that, yeah, what's the point of this? I want to be happier. Is my life generally better? And the answer is hell yes. Before, when you had this sea of information, a lot of people around you and much more likes and, and views and things like that, um, you had a lot more of that stuff, but your life was worse. So you have to really take a look at, uh, are you happy and do you want your life to be better? Well, and, and I, I think to, to kind of follow up on that human, a lot of guys in the men's community engage in that exercise of engineering t over and over again, refining it, trying to boil it down, distill it some more, reduce risk. But at some point, you have to realize that the objective is to build a bridge, not engineer a bridge. And to mm. Carew's that he was making earlier, I think a lot of guys find their way into the community and they're constantly engineering the bridge, but they don't ever want to start building the bridge. Well, I mean, like, uh, I mean, on one side, the, pr the, the, the positive is the world was built mostly by men who actually practically build bridges. So, you know, um, carpenters, they'll say, uh, measure twice, cut once. Whereas right. guys yeah. now, because they're practical and they build, it's like, we don't just measure tw twice, we're measuring 5,000 times be before we even decide <laughs> to cut. So That's right. there's we've got that instinct of like, measure, 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 be before they finally pull the trigger and cut that piece of wood. Um, unfortunately, well, they, try, they try to measure, but, but they don't know what a ruler is. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, guys, on that, sorry, I really have to go. I've got a family thing on. Uh, maybe we dis uh, continue this conversation, but for now, I'll end it and sure. uh, we'll do it again. But um, thanks, guys. I have to go. Have All a right. Time. Have a good one. See ya. Bye. See ya.